Hello, hi. Welcome to this lecture on commercial law. And we want to look at the topic of the doctrine of undisclosed principle, an examinable topic, controversial, because this is a doctrine for which a principle, even though it is unknown to a third party, yet there can be a binding contractual relationship with that third party, permitting for the principle to sue the third party for the contract that the third party never knew he had made with such an undisclosed principle. Let's begin by looking at the definition of what the doctrine means. And so, this is where the agent is acting for a principle whose existence is unknown to a third party. And the third party contracts with the agent, not knowing that he is in reality contracting with the undisclosed principle, because the agent is actually acting for an undisclosed principle. And so we call this the doctrine of undisclosed principle. Now this must be contrasted from or distinguished from the doctrine of disclosed principle, but just that the principle was unnamed. In the case of where the principle is disclosed but unnamed, then this is a case of where the third party knows that the agent is an agent, just that he does not know whom the agent is acting for, but that the third party knows that there is a principle. Our focus for this recording or this lecture is the doctrine of undisclosed principle, and we now want to look at the effect. What then is the effect of this doctrine? And this is seen in the following points, where when the doctrine applies, the effect is that the agent will have committed an act or a contract that will legally bind the undisclosed principle with the third party. It does not matter that the third party does not know of the existence of the UP, but yet because the agent was acting for someone else, that someone else will take the benefit of the contract. However, it must be noted that the agent himself will also remain liable on the contract. It's because when the third party made the contract, at the time, he was, in his mind, having the intention to contract with A. And so here is a recognition of the intention of the third party, that since he was intending to contract with A, the agent, we allow the agent to still remain liable on such a contract. However, it does not mean to say that the third party can sue both parties. The third party has to make an election or a choice in suing either the undisclosed principal or the agent. The law will not allow for a double compensation to the third party. Now, as far as the third party is concerned, he has to make that election, and the moment he has done so, to choose unequivocally to sue one or the other, then the two rights he has between the UP or A has now merged to become one. And we call this doctrine of merger and election. And the effect being, he is now unable to sue the other party. Having explained what is the doctrine of UP and its effect, what then is the rationale for this doctrine? For example, if the third party was intending to contract with the agent, then why then do we allow for a contract to arise between the undisclosed principal and the third party? Would this not be inconsistent with the doctrine of privity? Let's now look at the rationale for the doctrine. And this is seen in the case of the Heron Europe and S.T. Bolton, where in this case a court talked about how it's assumed that the third party is willing to contract either with the agent or with anyone that the agent may be representing, even though the existence and the identity is unknown. And that is true for the majority of most ordinary commercial contracts. And a good example is this. Say, for example, that I may call to make a booking for a restaurant dining reservation. And when I call to make a booking for dinner reservations, and the restaurant takes my booking, to the restaurant, it does not matter whether I'm contracting for myself or whether I'm contracting for someone else. As far as they're concerned, this is your typical ordinary commercial contract. They will intend to make a contract the identity is less important. And so whether I show up and I make payment 
or the person I call for on behalf of, then this ghost principal shows up to pay for the booking or for the dinner, the restaurant is perfectly happy. And so that's really how we understand the rationale for this doctrine. And so by way of this diagram, we see how that between the principal and the agent, the agent is acting for the principal, acting within his authority, and contracts with the third party. Now no doubt the third party is primarily contracting with the agent, but what I want you to note is this, that as far as the third party is concerned, he is contracting with either the agent or the principal, it does not matter to him whom he is contracting with, so long as there is a contract, and that being a primary focus, intention to make a contract, not so much as with whom the contract was made with. And so the moment we find that there is such intention by the third party to contract, accordingly, there will be a binding contract between himself and the undisclosed principle. Now in order for the doctrine of undisclosed principle to arise, we want to look at one very important requirement established in various cases, no less in this case by the Privy Council of Siu Yin Kwan, where the court emphasized that the agent must have been acting within his actual authority. And this has to be contrasted from where the agent may be perhaps be acting within his apparent authority. That will not be acceptable. The law requires for the agent to be acting within the actual authority and only when A is so doing, then will the UP be bound, allowing UP, the undisclosed principle, to sue on a contract and vice versa for the third party to sue on a contract. Obviously, if the agent had acted outside authority, then therefore the undisclosed principle should not be bound because this was an action done outside authority. Having understood as to when the doctrine will apply, what is the usual or main focus in the examination? And what is usually confusing as well is the exceptions, as in when will the doctrine not apply? And in the same case of Siwin Kwan, the court laid out two situations as to when is it that the exception, or rather the doctrine, will not apply, and that is firstly, where the terms of the contract may expressly or by implication exclude the principal's right to sue. And secondly, the contract itself or its circumstance show that the agent is the true and only principal. Let's look at these two exceptions one by one, starting with now this exception where the contract itself surrounding the contract show that the agent is a true and only principle. And to understand this, it's best illustrated by way of these two cases. The first case, the case of Humble and Hunter, where the agent had described himself as the owner. Whereas in the other case of Fred Drakhorn that we contrast from, the agent described himself as a charterer, someone who will charter out a ship to be rented or to be leased by another party. Now, looking at these two cases, which would you think will is where this exception apply? Where the contract shows that the agent is the true and only principal, and there is no one else behind that agent. And if you look at these two cases, it's very clear that this is the case of Humble and Hunter, where the exception would apply, where in this case, because the agent had described himself as the owner, this would give the impression that there's no one else behind him, that A is the true and only principal, and therefore, accordingly, the undisclosed principal should not be allowed to intervene. In contrast, in Fred Drakhorn, because the agent had merely described himself as a charterer, there's every possibility that whilst he might be the principal, but there may also be the existence of a principal behind him. He may charter out a vessel, but that may not mean that he's the owner. It could be that he himself is one who is also leasing the vessel. He now charters it out to another party. And so because of the possibility of the existence of an undisclosed principal, the third party should so-called take the risk that he's contracting not with the agent, but indeed with the undisclosed principal, and therefore, we allow for the UP to intervene 
in this situation. Whether it's a humble and hunter situation or a threat drug horn situation, really, it's important to note that it's a test of construction, where we construe the contract to understand from the contract itself, from the surrounding circumstance, exactly what the true nature of the contract is, and whether or not does it permit for an undisclosed principle to still intervene, or could it be that it is excluded, as was in the case of Humble and Hunter, where because of how we construe the contract, how we construe the facts and the description used by the agent himself, it may show that he was intended or regarded or perceived by the third party to be the true and only principle, and in so doing now, the undisclosed principle cannot intervene. Now we have another exception, and this other exception in a sense is one that appears to be a major focus in examination, and that is where the terms of the contract expressly or by implication exclude the principal's right to sue, and obviously then his liability to be sued. And to understand this case, we have these two cases of Sai and Butt, and another case later, where in this case here was the undisclosed principal who had engaged an agent to buy tickets to the opening's next theatre performance. Knowing full well that he himself would not be successful because he is a renowned, fierce, critical movie critic or theatre critic, and so the third party would not have sold him those tickets. And this is why he used an agent. On the other hand, on very similar facts, the undisclosed principal used an agent to buy a piece of property. Again, very similar to the earlier case of Sign, but that was because here in Dyson and Randall, the undisclosed principal also knew that the third party would not have sold the land or the property to him directly. And that's why he went through an agent. And so both cases are fairly similar. But if you were to look at the detailed facts of both cases, look at the nature of the contract and the background, you would come away with a feeling that it is a case of sight and butt, where the exception would apply, and the UP cannot intervene. This is because in this case of sight and butt, the contract seems to clearly exclude the principal's right to sue, because the third party clearly would have intended to contract with the agent and would not have wanted to contract with the principal. Whereas in the case of Dyson and Randall, the court came to a different conclusion and said the exception did not apply. This was after all a contract to buy land and the personality of the parties in a contract is less important. And because of that, that's why the court said that the undisclosed principal may still intervene. I suppose that what would be a key reconciling factor for this case is the fact that this was a land transaction and being a land transaction in general, it is more of a commercial type of contract for which the identity of the parties are less important compared to if I'm selling you tickets to attend the opening next show for which the person or the personality of the parties are more crucial. Now, if at this juncture you find it difficult to reconcile both cases, we now want to see, understand that it is the case of Dice and Randall that is a preferred case. It's preferred because, generally speaking, the majority of contracts are such that the identity of the parties are less important. And so in an examination, and where appropriate, you would want to be able to mention both cases, its conclusions for both cases, and how Dice and Randall is preferred, and why. The reason why it's preferred is because this represents the majority of most commercial contracts where the actual identity of the parties are not so important and that the contract itself, the making of the contract is more paramount and so we allow the undisclosed principle to intervene. Now granted, it may still be where that you still have some difficulties in understanding or in trying to reconcile both cases because the facts of both cases are somewhat similar. Let's look at now these following factors which we can rely on to reconcile both cases and more importantly to help us understand when will the exceptional case of sight and butt apply. And I have this acronym of PINK PAS, P-I-N-K-P-A-S, 
that I'll use now to reconcile both cases to see how is it that we can come to a conclusion of whether we apply side and bud and dice and rental. So the factors now of pink pass, P-I-N-K, P-A-S. P that stands for examining the positive attributes of the agent, whether or not the third party contract based on such attributes of the agent that it's not so much as me wanting to contract, but because I want to deal with the agent. And so if that is so, then this might be a case where the UP may not be able to enforce the contract. Then I, the identity of the parties, very similar to the earlier point, how crucial is the identity or personality of the parties to the contract formation issue? Is it something that's material, that's striking? You must be who you are. And if that's the case now, then UP may or may not enforce the contract. Then N, the negative attributes of the undisclosed principle. For example, the case of sight and bud is a useful illustration where the third party had contracted precisely because had he known the truth of who the UP was, he would not have sold. And so if you contract knowing that this is merely the agent and not the UP, and you known the existence of the UP, you would not contract. And therefore, the UP may not be able to enforce on the facts of sign. But as I mentioned earlier on, this was a case whereby the undisclosed principle was a fierce movie critic or theater critic. And in the past, he has written very bad reviews uh, on such kinds of shows. And so the organizers were very concerned and in particular wanted to make sure that this person does not attend. And that's why now, based on this particular negative attribute, the court came to the conclusion the way it did to exclude the undisclosed principle from enforcing the contract. And UP did not apply as a doctrine. So it's P-I-N-K. K stands for knowledge of the parties. Whether would the undisclosed principle know or ought to have known that the third party would not intend to contract with him. And in sign, but this was a fact that was known to the third part, to the agent, as well as, or rather, it was well known to the undisclosed principle, where the undisclosed principle knew that the TP would not want to deal with him. And that's why now the court came to the conclusion to exclude the UP from enforcing the contract. Then P, personal service contract. If when you examine the facts of an exam question, you find that this is a type of contract, where it is a contract for personal service, and this is why the third party contracted with the agent, expecting that agent to perform that personal service contract, then obviously UP may not intervene. A good example would be a case of where I may engage a famous artist to paint a portrait of myself. That's because I want to have the services of that famous artist, not where the artist now is merely an agent for someone else. I don't want that someone else to paint a portrait of me. And so this is an example of what I mean by a personal service contract as a factor to help us understand when is it that Sight and Bud or Dice and Randall may apply. And then the next factor would be A, to examine whether or not is this an assignable contract. There are some contracts made for which the terms are very clear that is to be non-assignable is to be performed by the named identified contracting parties. And so if that were to be the case, where the contract made between TP and A is one for which we can construe to be non-assignable, then therefore it can't be assigned and it can't be benefiting the undisclosed principal who will now be excluded and cannot enforce the contract. Although of course this is only a factor, and even in this case of Suyin Kwan, the court said it's not conclusive, to automatically prevent the undisclosed principle from enforcing the contract. Now we have now a few more. The seventh factor is this, and it's whether or not is this a commercial contract, where it's a commercial contract, then therefore as mentioned throughout this whole recording, that in general, the parties are not concerned with the identity of the parties. They are more concerned with making that commercial contract. And therefore the undisclosed principle may apply. And number eight, the last one, to look at the surrounding circumstances. 
where whatever that can be relevant to show whether the UP is permitted to enforce the contract or not, or is the UP excluded, will now be this last factor, such as for example in sight and butt. It is not just a contract to sell tickets, but tickets to the first opening night. And that being an important night for the organizers, for which now they want only certain people to attend and not anyone. And that's why the undisclosed principal was not allowed to take the benefit of the contract made by the agent who bought those tickets for him. Whereas in contrast, in Des and Randall, as mentioned earlier on, this was a contract to sell land, where the personality of the parties are less important, where generally speaking we recognize this to be a typical commercial contract, and therefore that surrounding circumstance indicates the possibility of allowing for such a principal to enforce a contract. So there are these eight factors that you would want to discuss in examination. The factors of PINK PACS, P-I-N-K, P-A-C-S, and I've put this acronym in the hope that it helps you to memorize and to use these factors in examination where relevant, and then to argue and conclude in one case or the other whether or not would the case of sight and butt apply. But again, take note that between these two cases of sight and butt and Dyson and Randall, sight and butt is exceptional, which will only apply in exceptional cases. Otherwise, generally speaking, you find that it will not apply. And so I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture on the doctrine of an disclosed principle. And if you like this lecture, please feel free now to subscribe, to share, and to like. Thank you.